three conversations: the first and the third between two students, and the second between a student and a clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, it's Mike, isn't it? Yes, and you're Phoebe. Phoebe, right? Where are you headed? I'm looking for the main hall. So am I. Are you going there to register for next year? Yes, I was told to go to administrations and fill in an application form. That's what I'm about to do. I went to information, and they told me it was at the end of this corridor. Then we have to turn left and immediately right. That should lead us to the exit, where opposite we should find the entrance to ground level main hall. It's a big old red building. From there, we need to go to the first level. And then follow the signs. Apparently, it's the second office opposite the foyer. It would be pretty hard to miss. That sounds easy. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Well, since we're both heading in that direction, let's go together. Hopefully, it won't take too long. I haven't had anything to eat, and I'm starving. Me too. Well, how about I go to the canteen and get us something while you make your way to the main hall? I'm sure there's going to be quite a wait. There always is. I can meet you there. Sounds like a good plan. What do you want me to get you? Um, how about a chicken and salad roll and a drink? Okay. What if they don't have a chicken and salad roll? Anything similar like ham and salad, or just plain salad and cheese. Oh, and don't forget the drink. I feel so dehydrated. No problem. What type of drink? I don't know.、Um, How about a Coke? No, nothing like that. Something healthier. An orange juice? They're usually full of sugar unless you get it freshly squeezed. Water? Yes, that's perfect. Here, take two pounds. That should cover it. If it's more, I'll give it to you when you get back. I only have a twenty, and you know that they get cranky if you give them large notes. Okay. See you in five minutes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. First year economics. I just have to fill out this form for our records. What's your name? Phoebe Payne. Can you spell that for me? Sure. P H O E B E P A Y N E. Your address? Six. Wainwright Avenue. That's W A I N R I G H T, Nottingham. Nottingham. And your phone number? It's not connected yet. I've just moved in. Okay. When you get your phone connected, contact us. I'll just make a note that your phone number is to be advised. I'll do that. What course were you doing? Law? No, economics. First year. First year economics. Yes, that's right. Okay, take this card across to the economics department and get it stamped, and then you need to come back here to pay your fees. I've made an arrangement to pay in installments. Do you have any documentation verifying that? Yes, I have a statement from administration. Okay, when you return, we'll have a look at it. Thank you very much. Here you are. It was quicker than I thought, but I have to get this card stamped and return here to organize my fees. 
That's good. It means that I won't have to wait long either. How did you get on? What with? Oh, the food. Well, there wasn't much left, so I got you a cheese and tomato sandwich and water. That's fine. Do I owe you any more? No, I need to give you back three pounds. But I only gave you two. Oh yeah, <laughs> I thought you gave me a fiver. Okay, so we're square. So what do I have to do? Go to the desk and give your personal details. Then they'll give you a card that you need to take to your faculty. What's your major? Environmental science. Okay, so you'll have to take the card to the environmental science faculty and get the card stamped. Return to administration in the main hall and organize your fees. And that's it. Yes, that means you're registered. Then we receive a letter with the details of our course, where we'll be informed to go to the notice board, or online to find out when and where our lectures are. Okay, let's have this bite to eat first. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two teachers discussing a school trip. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Oh, there you are, Paul. Do you have a few minutes? Can we think about this year's school trip? Hi, Jean. Yes, of course. Have you got any ideas? I've been looking through some information, and I've brought a few leaflets with me. Here you are. Okay, thanks. Just remind me when the trip is. Next Friday, we'll be leaving at nine and be back here at around four. So we've probably got time to visit a couple of places. Let's see, what leaflet have you got there? Central Gardens. Looks like a nice place. It's open from nine until six, so we could go there any time we wanted, really. What about there in the morning and then somewhere else in the afternoon? Farmers market would be an option first as well, at least until they close at one. Or we could try Gray Castle. That should be possible in the morning or in the afternoon. Oh, hang on, that's at the weekend. The last admission is at noon on weekdays. Greenhall says the same thing. Queens Park opens at eight, so we could go there first. Or, according to these times, we could go there on the way back to school because they don't close the gates until sunset during the week. Okay, that gives us a few options. We went to Queens Park a couple of years ago, didn't we? I seem to remember that the pupils really enjoyed it. It'd be nice to go somewhere new as well. I've seen groups from other schools going around Gray Castle. So have I. But then again, maybe we should play it safe and go to Green Hall. At least we've got experience of taking classes round there. Farmers Market is popular with other schools, though, so it must be interesting. It'd be good to go somewhere where someone can show the pupils around. You know, explain things to them. I've been on a tour around the castle, and they do a really good job. I think they have guides at the hall too, don't they? 
It says here that they used to, but don't anymore. You can get shown round Central Gardens, though. I think we'd have to do any explaining if we took the pupils to the market or the park. That wouldn't be a problem, though. No, and at least those two would be free, wouldn't they? I think all the others charge, and we'd have to get the parents to pay some money. I'm sure they wouldn't mind paying if it was a small amount. Let me check the leaflets. There's a special price for large groups at Grey Castle. Oh, but you can get into Central Gardens for nothing. Right. Oh, I've just thought of something. We wouldn't need to book anything if we were going to Queen's Park. But what about the other places? Uh, Central Gardens say you need to let them know if there are more than ten people in your group, which would include us. The same at Grey Castle. Farmer's Market says you can just turn up, and so does Green Hall. Right. Well, I suggest we take the pupils to Grey Castle for a tour in the morning. How does that sound? Yes, sounds good. We should contact them to book it as soon as possible. In the afternoon, we can do something a bit more relaxed at the park, and we'll have to think about going to Green Hall another year. Shame Farmer's Market isn't open, but... We can't change the day. So that's a decision then. Now, let's think about what we're going to get the pupils to do. It's a school trip, after all, and we should give them some work to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I think they should know something about the place before they go. That way they know what they're looking at, and they'll be able to write about it better when they get back. I'll put some information together to look at at home, and give them copies after the next lesson. Good idea. I'll write something for them to do as they're going round the place. We did a quiz last year, and that worked really well. I'll do the same kind of thing this time. Okay. Now, what about the travel arrangements? How are we getting there? What do you think? I remember one year Mrs. Jackson took her group by bus, and that was a complete nightmare. Hmm. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We could hire a coach for the day, which is what we usually do. Or there's the train. It's rush hour, though, isn't it? So it'll be really crowded. And it'll be more convenient for the rest of the day if we've got our own transport. Yes, we'll do that then. Anything else? Oh, we need to let the parents know what's happening. We could ask the office to call everyone. It would take too long with so many. I know when we send a letter home, there are always a few pupils who lose it. But not all the parents have email yet, so I don't think we have any choice, really. I'll write something and take it to the school office this afternoon. Right. I'll go and tell the pupils the good news. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first, have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about Help the Children Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called The Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community. And although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing. We don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About £20 per canister, and we'll need about 10 And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a 1,000 students in the school, so if even one-third of the students buy one, we'd need about 350 balloons. We've decided to order 500 so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about 1p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about 50 pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of £1.50, and we sell all 500 of them, we'll end up making a profit of £1 per balloon. So that's £500 in total. That's fantastic. And it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event who's going to give us £1,000. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But, you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount? A thousand instead of five hundred. We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas, then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. OK. Let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful Ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I'm going to talk about the city of Barcelona and its architecture. First, the city. Barcelona is a city of some one and a half million people. It is a port situated on the northeast coast of Spain in the province of Catalonia. The people speak Catalan as their native language, but most are also fluent in Castilian Spanish, and some speak English too. The city centre is surrounded by a ring road, which encloses a grid, with two major roads running diagonally across it. These are the Avenidas Diagonal and Meridiana. Probably the most famous street in Barcelona is La Rambla, which connects the Placa de Catalunya in the town centre to the statue of Columbus on the water's edge. All along the centre of this wide boulevard are stalls selling flowers and artistic works. Barcelona was founded by the Carthaginians from modern-day Tunisia in North Africa. It grew under the influence of the Roman Empire, later becoming the capital of Spain. Under strong government, it expanded its trade, exporting cloth to other Mediterranean ports, and establishing itself as a financial centre. It went into decline after 1400, and in 1640 it was the centre of the Catalan Revolution against King Philip IV of Spain. Now it is considered by many to be the cultural centre of Spain, and the Olympic Games were held there in 1992. Now to the architecture. Throughout the city there are many fine buildings, churches, cathedrals, markets and squares, which date back to the 13th century. One very fine square, which can be entered from La Rambla, is the Placa Real, or Royal Square. This was built by Molina in the 19th century. Seven narrow passages lead into a large central area, which is surrounded by two-storey buildings. Most of the ground floor is occupied by restaurants and bars, and it is traditionally a place of music and entertainment. It is impossible to talk about the architecture of Barcelona without mentioning Gaudi, who dominated the scene from the 1880s until his death in 1926. His style was unique, a decorative form of Art Nouveau, the style of the 1920s and 30s in Europe. It was based on organic natural forms, which often seem to defy the qualities of the materials they are made from. I will mention just three of his best-known works today. The first is Guel Palace. This was built for the Count of Guel, one of Gaudi's main supporters. The building features two arched gates, which lead into the stable area. Inside are two circular staircases, one for people and the other for horses. The ground floor is built of brick, but there is also much natural stone used in the construction. The roof is quite fantastic with brightly coloured sculptures built around the chimneys and ventilation shafts. Another project commissioned by Guell is the park named after him. This was meant to be a garden city with 50 houses, but in fact only two were ever finished. The influence of nature is strong in the cave-like spaces and animal figures, and again, much use has been made of brilliantly coloured surfaces. But the greatest of Gaudi's works is still under construction, and it is not expected to be finished until 2041. He began work on this cathedral, known as La Sagrada Familia, Church of the Holy Family, in 1882, 
which means that it will have taken 159 years to complete. The finished building will have 18 towers, the highest being 170 metres high. The building will be 95 metres long by 60 metres wide, and it will hold 13,000 people, a truly impressive monument to Gaudi's great genius. And that's all we have time for today. Next week, we'll look at some of Gaudi's smaller projects and also his furniture designs. Please make sure that you complete your assignment on Le Corbusier by this coming Friday. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.